I want to I want to talk about the most uh, fascinating <coughs> object in the universe that you can see, and uh, that's the moon. And I I bet that if you like most members of an astronomy club, the moon is something that you wish were less visible. Uh, most people in astronomy clubs plan their star parties when the moon is other places. And I want to try to suggest to you that you're making a huge mistake. So here's, here's the moon versus the universe. And uh, on the left side is a photograph by Ralph Lena in Italy. That's a, a little telescope, a five-inch telescope. And on the right side is a drawing Frank McCabe made uh, with an 18-inch telescope, a large telescope. And his object of interest was this uh, NGC object up there. And if you look closely, and, and he spent a long time making this drawing, you can tell that he could perceive two or maybe three different subtle gradations in tone. It's a faint fuzzy. You have to be really dedicated to to spend your time seeing this. And I guess the idea is that, wow, photons from this distant galaxy hit my eye. It's a personal visceral reaction that you have, and that's exciting. But frankly, there's nothing there. I mean, you can't see hardly anything. Whereas in the moon, with a much smaller telescope and just one portion of the sliver, there are thousands of different individual features <clears throat> that you can see and study and understand. So the moon, is the only place you can look in the universe with a backyard telescope and actually recognize it as a place. It's a place with extensive geography. Lots of things that happen there that you can understand. And the problem is, a lot of people are confused when they look at the moon because there's so much detail. And so the moon needed a Messier list. The Messier list, as everybody knows, was, was derived 150 or so years ago it was, it's basically a, a checklist. Check this off. This is not a comet. Messier was looking for comets, and he kept seeing these faint, fuzzy things that could be comets. I mean, it's pretty bad. That's, that's what happens when you look at faint fuzzies. You can't tell if it's a planetary nebula, a galaxy, or a comet. Uh, and so he started making a list of these really fascinating, the best in the sky sort of things to look at. And uh, it's a great place to start looking at the rest of the universe. It's a guide. Well, we needed something like that for the moon, so I made that a couple of years ago. I called it the Lunar 100. And uh, I selected a hundred of the interesting places on the moon, and uh, each one of them was selected because it's an interesting story. It tells us something about how the moon formed, how the moon evolved through time, or, or perhaps in a few cases, how humans interacted with the moon. And they're arranged from number one, which is the moon itself, uh, which almost everybody can find without a finding chart, uh, to, to one object that's just barely on the far side, very difficult to find. So they're arranged from easiest to hardest to find, and they uh, uh, can't be seen on one night. You can't have your computerized telescope go to it and, and see it, because uh, typically your computerized telescope will show you half of the moon, and, and so which of these thousands of objects you can see is the thing you're looking at. So it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge, in fact. Few people have, have reported to me, at least, that they've seen all 100. Uh, they're all visible, they're all there, they all have something interesting, I think, to tell you. So I want to uh, have you remember the moon. It's probably what you first looked at when you got interested in astronomy. Uh, it's still worth remembering and going back to and looking at and being excited about. And the more you know about it, the more it will, will be so. And uh, you'll notice this photograph has Tycho, the conspicuous ray crater, at the top. And then the next one has it at the bottom. And uh, this sort of represents the different types of views you can get of the moon. The moon is, is again, uh, other than the, the Milky Way, which we see some beautiful pictures of over here, but it's almost invisible to modern citizens of the world. Uh, other than the Milky Way, the moon is the only thing where you can really get a strong appreciation of, of diversity. Uh, by looking with your eyeball. And so typically we see the, the moon uh, in one orientation, then we look through a telescope which has uh, all sorts of reflecting apparatus that flips it upside down. So you, you can see the moon in either orientation. I, I made the moon the lunar uh, object number one because it is, is huge, it's big. It's there in our face, in our sky. 
And uh, it's huge compared to our planet. Until we discovered the first of Pluto's two moons, uh, which is even bigger compared to its planet than our moon, this was really an anomaly in the solar system. And when you look at Jupiter and you see the little dots of its four Galilean satellites, those are minuscule by comparison. So clearly, just the ex fact of the existence of the moon says there's something unique about it. Why aren't the other moons in the solar system as big? And in, in the last 15 years, we've all heard about the idea of a, a giant collision in early Earth history, where a very large body of planetesimal about the size of Mars hit the Earth, apparently, threw off a, a huge debris cloud of material that re accreted some of it, did most of it probably escaped into <coughs> space or hit the Earth, and formed our moon. And so the moon did have, apparently, a special origin. We think the other moons uh, in, around Jupiter and the Galilean, uh, sorry, the other planets in the far parts of the solar system, we think they're all objects that either were captured or formed in place from the solar nebula, the, the planetary nebula. Uh, the moon is, is a museum of the solar system, too, and part of the reason it is it has no air, or water, or light. There's been nothing to muck around with the basic geology. So the moon's Average age, when you look at the, the old highlands, which are about 4.4 billion years old, and the young lava flows, which are about 3.5 billion years old, the average age of the moon is ancient, say 4 billion years. Does anybody know the average age of all the surface rocks on the Earth? It's a half billion years. So the moon is about 4, and the Earth is about a half billion years old. Our planet is active, dynamic, it's constantly changing. If you want to understand sort of how planets form and grow and change, having the Earth that we live on shows us the, all the complexities of a dynamic, active planet. And having is our next door neighbor, one of the primitive, relatively primitive ancient bodies in the solar system, shows us how we start. The Earth probably looked like the moon. It, four billion years ago, and uh, four to four point five billion years ago. So we have a museum uh, of the moon right here, of, of the solar system right here next door. And what we learned by looking at that is there's only two basic processes that are important for planetary bodies. Impact crater and volcanism. If, if we live here on the Earth, we see all sorts of things. The, the terrain around us has been smoothed by glaciers that's flowed over. No glaciers on the moon. Glaciers may be on Mars, glaciers may be on Titan, but no glaciers on the moon. So we, we can try to get to the basics of how planets form and evolve by looking at the moon. And then, as I say, craters are the, the building blocks of the moon. In fact, the moon was made by accretion of all this leftover material from the, from the big smash into the Earth. And so cratering built the moon up. In high speed cratering pieces would hit and collide, break apart and scatter. So it required low enough speed cratering that they could hit and, and stick. So impact cratering has been important throughout the planet's history. And anybody know this crater? Copernicus, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are so smart. <laughs> anybody know this crater? <laughs> Copernicus is young. It's a billion years old. It's one of the young features on the moon. It's rays go across the lunar mare surrounding it. So this is a young crater. It's 93 kilometers across. You could easily fit the city on this side and others on that side. Usually in the United States I say what cities, but I don't know the scale of things here. But I'm sure Gal Galway and, and uh, Cork could fit somewhere near there. Um, and it's a complex crater. Complex is, there are two types of craters. Simple, the small ones under about 15 to 20 kilometers in diameter, which are just bowl-shaped things. They look like they've been turned out and laid. And complex ones, when the, when the impact into the ground is larger, it releases uh, so much energy is taken up, breaking up the crust and melting material and excavating it, that the hole that's left is, no, is so big that the strength of the rocks can no longer support that sharp face. And so they slide back down and collapse. And then as they collapse, you get the terraces formed. And so the, the terraces are a reflection of the strength of the rocks that the craters are formed in. And one of the studies that some colleagues and I did some years ago is, is that there's a difference in the diameter of onset of terraces in the lunar highlands and the lunar mare. 